Relatively. Let's let's put that in context. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, let's put that in context. Okay, great, thanks. Folks, thanks so much for coming. If you didn't know, we're going to talk about Moodle today. And if you did know and you still came, God bless you for doing that. Because we're going to talk about Moodle today. I do teach, actually, part-time at my institution, so I have a strong chance I'm probably going to bore you anyway, all right? So, because it's kind of what we do. You don't want to come here. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'll give this to you. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about installing and using Moodle. Um, Moodle is, believe it or not, a really worthy option. There are some huge, huge packages in the LMS space learning management system space um, that are lots and lots of good money. I work at a small school that's about 1,100 students, right? So we're not big, we're not, we're not, uh, you know, we're not the University of Toronto, which is 100,000 students, or UC, which is 25,000, University of Calgary, but we're 1,000. Well, for me to purchase a commercial pro, uh, LMS would be somewhere in the 30 to $40,000 range per, that's the initial cost plus 20% maintenance per year. So, you know, being that uh, we're faith-based and cheap, uh, that changes your equations pretty quickly, right? <laughs> so, you start looking around. Well, the great thing about Moodle is Moodle is actually a popular, well-used, well-supported piece of open source software. How many times have we ran into open source software projects and we say, this is a great solution? Not widely used, not widely supported. Moodle is not that case. Uh, about 18 percent of all universities worldwide use Moodle as their LMS. So that's a pretty good number. In my own local area, there's 28 what we call major public uh, and private institutions in Alberta. All 28 of us use Moodle in some regards. Okay. So I mean, there's some, some of the big universities that, you know, they, they've got so much money that they use all of them. Like, hey, it's fun. Let's go, let's let's buy Canvas too, and then we'll use Moodle and we'll, you know, use all sorts of other stuff. The great thing is um, you can do that kind of stuff. Um, why we glommed onto Moodle, not just because it's because we're cheap and big this, um, but that was a big part of it, is that Moodle is so unbelievably flexible. Because there's not anything I've had a faculty member come to me say, hey, can Moodle do that? And we've always been able to go, yep. Yeah, we can do that. We can make it do that. Okay. Moodle, in my institution, is supported by one guy. That's me. <laughs> so I support 1,100 students. I support 90 faculty members. Um, and so far, uh, there's only been a few times where fire and pitchforks have come out into my presence. But other than that, we've got it. Okay. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit on installing Moodle on uh, Ubuntu 16.04. You can do that on CentOS as well, and I'll give you some tips on that. And really, if you can administer a Linux box, like if you know how to use apt, you're probably going to get through this just fine, okay? So, and don't hesitate to ask questions all the way through, and I'll probably shrug my shoulders and say, that's a great question, and you should ask someone who knows what they're doing. No, go ahead, sir. <laughs> oh, no, Angel, the fact that there's still three schools left. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, shameless plug. You know, I, I actually do work for a university. I am their IT director. Uh, been with the college for uh, 10 years. They haven't figured out that the House of Cards is still there. You know, right? You're with me? If you, any of you do system administration work professionally, you realize it's a House of Cards. Someday they will find out you don't know anything. Um, <clears throat> had Moodle in place about seven years ago. Probably actually eight, come to think of it. And I took over the Moodle duties full time four years ago. So. Um, and I also teach, like I said, for a living sometimes too. I teach uh, in the business department and I teach one solitary course, Managing Information Systems. Not that I know anything about that. Hey, so we're going to talk about prerequisites, getting uh, MySQL up and going, PHP, FM, configuring NGINX, using Git. Oh, Git is the secret sauce to actually administering Moodle and keeping them up. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, finishing off those configurations. And then I'll give you some examples of a functioning middle site and what it looks like and what you can do with it. So, yeah, there are some prepackaged like ISOs you can pull down with Moodle. But, you know, it's not that hard to roll your own. 
And there's a certain amount of joy from actually getting this thing up and running and knowing it's secure. Um, you know, again, uh, because I'm the one that supports it, you take a lot of decisions through, through you know, uh, to bring a system up that maybe are just all about trying to get it up and running because you're a small school and you're trying to be secure and, you know, all those things rolled into one. So naturally, I kind of moved towards a Ubuntu type install. You could sure do it on any other Linux around. Okay. Um, I use NGINX over Apache, and I'm sure that there's some of you that would say, what? It's crazy, you should use X, HTTP server. I just use NGINX because I know it, and Apache makes me angry every time I try to configure. So, um, yeah, that's why. <laughs> okay. And actually, the, uh, one of the reasons, too, is if you actually end up using something like Let's Encrypt, uh, the sub-configuration for uh, NGINX is, is so much easier if you use the Ubuntu package. I mean, it works with Apache too, but it's just, oh, it's so brain dead. And you can actually read the config file and know what it's doing. Oh, right, that's why it failed. I can fix that. Okay. Um, yep. I think we've talked about that. So step one, you need a bare bones install. And then we're going to install just a few prerequisites. Okay. We'll do an app install of Maria or Maria DB, um, the client, and NGINX. Right? That'll give us enough to get going. Remember, you got to start that stuff right after. I don't know how many times I've actually installed things and wondered why it didn't work, only to find out that the daemon isn't running. Uh, you do need to install the EP, uh, EPEL release uh, for uh, NGINX under CentOS. And please make sure that you run MySQL secure installation at the very end of that, I beg of you. The basics. Now we can actually configure our database for Moodle. And really, it's just those few things to actually get our database up and running for Moodle. Why? It's because once we get to the install process, we're going to move over to the browser. And Moodle itself will take care of all the tables that it needs to create and securing those tables for you. And out of the box, Moodle does a great job of that. So, Believe it or not, we were crazy enough to, we even ran this under uh, Microsoft SQL at one point. I don't know why, because <laughs> we thought that might be fun to try. I guess, I don't know. Uh, but once I took, took it over, I went, no, no, we're going open source on the whole stack. That's just makes sense. So it's really just those few commands. One of the gotchas, um, or sorry, that is my little shameless plug that, uh, by the way, Digital Ocean or I'm sure Rackspace has a bunch of them too, or lots of other uh, guides are out there on how to install this stuff real securely. Okay, so just read some of those guides. Um, but anyway, those are some good ones that I found. One of the gotchas though is that Moodle requires a database that has UTF-8 encoding. So if you don't make that slight change to your my.cnf file, that Moodle will complain to high heaven and you cannot pr proceed with the installation. So, literally, you just open up the file and pipe that in there, okay? And you think, Steve, how did you know how to do this stuff? Moodle actually told me what to put in the my.cnf as I was doing the install, and it failed at a point and said, hey, by the way, could you go put this in and restart the installation? Like, I think they were trying to think of, it, of an educator trying to install this on their own. So it just requires a few PHP packages. There's the sudo <laughs> app install, <laughs> right? Do you have this slideshow online somewhere where we can just copy up all that? I that promise stuff? I'll put it up. I'll what? put it, I'll put put it, it up. up. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Just so you guys know, the um, generally, you know, like a basic LAMP install and in like an Ubuntu system or something that will have all that MySQL stuff like in there already, so you don't generally have to worry about it too much, as long as it's got Barracuda support, I believe. Like, yeah, I just did a, I just did a Ubuntu install so right out of the box. Yep, I don't know, yeah, it just works. Didn't have it, <laughs> believe it or not, didn't oh, have, didn't really? have the ATMP. Huh. Which surprised me, really? because I thought, isn't that the default now? No, it's not. Weird. That's really not unless they do something in 1604, I didn't realize. So. Um, Right? Uh, so yeah, just a few things to install. 
Then you need to actually hop over to this guy, to that file right there. And I think I've got this right here. Oops. And you're looking for this little setting in PHP right there. This is fixed path info. And you change it from one to zero. This is the default in PHP. Change it, and it'll start working. Okay? So it's all about the way that uh, the PHP follows those paths. And um, the default's one, of course, but we just need to change it to zero. And you have to do that also in the uh, FPM file as well. So there's that in there as well. Remember, you got to restart PHP FPM after that little configuration change. Now let's get on to NGINX. Again, this is why I love NGINX. This is my config file. Now, please don't use this in production. It's kind of missing a few things. Like, it's not secure. <laughs> but it's enough to get going if you want to do testing. Like, it's really that simple. Okay. Again, why I love it. And again, you know, if you're doing this on your own, use Let's Encrypt or something like that. By the way, Loom runs quite nicely in a virtualized environment. Like, we use it on all sorts of hypervisors. Hypervisors. Sorry, I'll make you come to the But we run it on top of Hyper-V. It never complains. Not ever. So. And I run it in VirtualBox for testing purposes and all that kind of stuff. Git! Ah, why well, I wanted to start this whole thing, right? So, once you've got the, the Git particulars installed. The great thing about Moodle is that you can manage updates through Git. And because uh, they're great and they, they post all their code at GitHub, oops, sorry. So I originally did a, uh, a git pull, and this, you know, using a git branch A, I can see all the various releases that they have. So if I really wanted to go back and install Moodle 2.0, I could. But the nice thing is I can always pull, you know, Moodle 3.4. Would I want to do an update to that? Let's do a git pull. And the fun thing is that, you know, it's going to go, obviously, whatever, you know, this is why we use Git for stuff, right? Because it's actually diffing, diffing the, uh, the patches that needs to apply to the files. And on the next login of Moodle, as me, as the administrator, it will update the database at that point in time. It's, it's pretty quick. This used to be, before, before Git was reliable to, uh, to do a lot of, well, that was great stuff. Um, <clears throat> before Git was reliable to actually do this with, an update of Moodle was kind of this, this um, you know, very scary experience that would take a couple hours, and we'd have to, you know, dedicate some resources to off hours to do this. This I'm brave enough to actually do during the middle of a school day and say, huh, they're all at lunch right now. I can take the server down for two minutes. They'll never even notice. I do, yeah. Not to like derail anything here, but like, <laughs> yeah, go for it. Brother. I just want to add, like, it's it's uh. If you guys don't need something as like super production ready as like an Nginx install, like super high performance, mm -hmm. if, it, if patch is fine for you, yeah. just task cell in Ubuntu. If any of you are familiar mm -hmm. with task cell, you just type it in and you can just select the LAMP server and you're pretty much good to go for Moodle. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just so you know. Yeah. Like, no, don't. Hey, I'm. I just use Nginx because I'm lazy and I know it. That's why. <laughs> Nginx is good. So, okay. Yeah. Let's hear it for laziness, right? 
So cool. So that's why the big deal about installing and using Git for this. So a new, because uh, Moodle out of the box will actually annoy you whenever a new release comes along. I get daily emails from Moodle because they're always doing changes and updates to, uh, in regards to security. So, I mean, that's one of the great things about it. They support both, um, they support two versions simultaneously. So right now it's both 3.4 and 3.3 are supported. Eventually 3.5 will get released and then 3.3 will drop off and now 3.4 and 3.5 will be supported. So it's nice that you don't always have to be pushed into upgrading to the latest and greatest version of it. Because okay. so I don't know if you know this about faculty, but they don't like lots of change. I don't, that's kind of something I had to get used to over my career as an IT director. They don't like change. Huh. Who knew? Um, <clears throat> So, there's our process of actually getting that update done. Again, you know, there's the commands to do it. Hey, I want to track Moodle 3.4, the stable. I'm going to get check that out. The checkup process, I think, on a 100 meg connection I had at home, took maybe five minutes to pull the code down. Okay. If I didn't ball things up too, too badly, I should. Oops. Spoke too soon. That will always make a difference, 10 times out of 10. So once you've done those, those steps, Moodle greets you with this. It's like, hey, now let's step through and actually configure it. There's some bit where it says, okay, great, you want it in English. Maybe you're gonna want something a little bit more professional than uh, an IP address as your web address, but uh, for now, we're gonna just take that. Then there's the Moodle directory, obviously where it's gonna store its stuff. And then there's the data directory. The data directory is important because Moodle can actually be tasked to actually do automated backups of, of classes. And you can schedule that, uh, you can either do that manually or you can do it automatically. And again, pretty key thing for faculty members because I love them to bits, right? Because it's my job and they keep me employed. Um, but they do crazy things on occasion, right? So we take, um, we take weekly backups of their courses. So if they really screw something up, I can restore and bang, they're good. The other neat thing is that if I've got a faculty member that says, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm leaving Ambrose and I'm going to go teach at the University of British Columbia, no worries. I hand them all their Moodle classes and they can take them with them. And they can actually upload them to that Moodle instance there. No big deal at all. They can do this themselves too, but trust me, they usually ask the IT department for help. So fine, hey, that's all great. So we confirm those, oh, I didn't, it's not writable, oh, my bad. to do in front of that, that would work a little better. Don't always tell me that my operations are not permitted. <laughs> or they tell me uh, my operations aren't permittable. Yeah. <laughs> Some machine bossing me around. That means an RM slash. Oh, that is. Yeah, that's always kind of a good idea to come out. Okay, I have to remember that. I might have this, right? Sometimes I just, you know, power off the computer. So teach it a lesson. Yeah. Enjoy. Well, I'll cheat. Sorry, gang.
fresh to that one screen. I wonder. I wonder. Yeah, I reset it. Oh my god. What's your WW data? www-data. Can you do an ls-al and merge www-html? Everything says read. And you want me to back up one and do it? Uh, yeah, just in bar dub dub. Yeah, 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 I see what you're saying. Um, I can do that, Alice, we'll give the permission flags to you. Oh, right. Yeah, thanks. If you want to, you just chmod 777 just to... Just get through it. Get yeah, go yeah. Chmod 777. Thanks, brother. Think that might do Maybe it. even the directory above too. I, I'm not sure if it's a kind yeah. of like a sibling of this one. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that's messy. No, don't worry about it. You're among friends. <laughs> it's a VM. Cool. I'll <laughs> just <laughs> I'll just vagrant <laughs> I'll just vagrant destroy it later on. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Um, Okay, well, I'll just skip by it because I can talk around it. Good. Eventually, you'll get to something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yay, sorry. You know, it's one of those things where you test this and you think, yeah, it worked great. And then you take it to a conference. Okay, so this is actually our little instance of Ambrose. Um, that's an actual picture of me. Um, before coffee or before, uh, actually, that's in the middle of a faculty meeting. Ah. Um, <laughs> but the power of Moodle is that, uh, again, you know, this is what a standard faculty member or even a student would see. Because Moodle is pretty flexible, so we actually have something that where we can pull in campus announcements. We have links to all of our other other products there, and students would then see what courses they actually have active at that time. With Moodle, you can do layouts like the following, right? So I've got, I've got the class that I just taught. I can do things like I can drag and drop documents to it. And I'll show you that in a second. There's a whole bunch of plugins for things like Turnitin, which is that little uh, icon there, which Turnitin actually does anti-plagiarism checking. So it checks all their assignments against millions and millions of other things on the internet, plus what they've turned into other classes at the institution, plus if they've actually referenced their citations properly, which is awesome stuff. And as a faculty member, it actually has a really, really good marking module that allows me to mark papers quite quickly. Moodle can be used for exams. So Moodle has a tie-in that you can actually install that, that ties in with a secure browser that runs in either Mac or Windows that secures the browser down that they cannot close the browser and will tie them to a certain exam that I hand out to the student. It's pretty awesome stuff. My uh, final for this year, I actually gave them the final through Moodle because, you know, they're business students. They said, we don't want to write for three hours. It's so hard. Okay, I might throw off. Life is not that hard, but okay, fine. Uh, <clears throat> so I just used Moodle for it. It was great because then at the end of the exam, I popped it open and started marking, marking the questions that I gave them. Hey, I was done. The rest of my faculty members are marking paper. <laughs> it takes them forever. I take pictures of myself on Twitter going, I'm done. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. So, but if you're backing up only once a week, then, then if they've turned into their exam, during exam Well, I'm also exam. taking false. I'm taking false of okay. uh, so you're Pulse capturing as yeah, things yeah. are happening. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's multiple layers. It must make me. Well, I suppose that's right. Or are others of you that are system administrators, right? We think that we're like ogres getting in there. Right? Okay. 
But the nice, you know, a nice thing about this is that it's just a, a nice sort of freeform way to drag content in. If I want to add more content, I click turn editing on. At that point, a little add or activity, add an activity or resource pops open. And Moodle gives me a whole bunch of choices of things I can add. So assignments is an obvious one, but there's a built-in chat function. There is checklists for the students. So if you want them to actually manage themselves in terms of how they work, that's fine. You can do online polling in class through the choice module. Right? So how many times have, you know, I've been in lots of classes where a professor will decide to use, hey, I'm going to poll you on the following thing. Could you answer this poll? They can go up to Moodle and do that. You can grab external tools. You know, there's lots of other tie-ins uh, that, that you can throw in that way that the instructor can do without even intervention from the IT department. Uh, forums, we use a lot of forums, and you can actually grade the forum responses, which is so awesome as an instructor. So I can get my students into a forum and say, hey, I'm gonna post a question, you need to respond back to this question. And then I can actually give them a grade based upon their response to that, which is pretty powerful. Glossary, lessons, questionnaires, quizzes. If you set up the forum, is that forum visible to more than one? It's visible to everybody you invited in, but are the responses better than that student? You can configure that. What's even cooler is that Moodle understands groups. So if I want to do groups with my class, let's say I, I say I got a class of 16, I want four groups of four. Either I can I can assign four groups with individuals in each one of the groups, or Moodle will actually take care of it for me. To and, say, and they can see you can see which part the students are responding back, so you can see if three are participating and one's just yeah. Okay, exactly. Because that never happens in group work, right? No. <laughs> Which is strange that it still happens actually in the work world too. Are um, you guys using your own servers? Yep. And and how many servers do you have? And are they ever like jammed up and all the instructors are doing family with at the same time? You haven't had any problem with I that? run this on a single VM. You run a single VM? A single VM that has four gigs of RAM on it. Four gigs of RAM. It never gets saturated. Which shocked me because I kind of thought, yeah, I'm kind of thinking that that's surprising. And if you know, if you know Hyper V, you can actually do like that dynamic allocation of memory. I'm sure yeah. you can in other hypervisors, mm -hmm. but I've never had to play around with other hypervisors. But we just do dy dynamic allocation of memory. It never goes over four gigs. We tell we tell it that's its starting limit. It never hits. It never bothers to move off four gigs. With a thousand students. Yeah. At any one time, I have. Anywhere from 100 to 300 people on the server. And we have a three hour kind of, you know, a login grace period. So they can come back to it in any time in three hours and it will just simply restart their session. I still don't, it still doesn't get saturated. Like it's just, I mean, that's the magic of Nginx and PHP on the back end, right? Yeah. And then it's because this is such a mature code base too. You know, when you're version 3.4 in a project that started in the late 90s, you might have some of those performance issues figured out. We used to have a back with Moodle one. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> kind of dating myself. Yeah. yeah, that's okay. You're my friend. I'm in my 50s. <laughs> um, what two of the more powerful ones I just want to emphasize before we move on is uh, the wiki. Is it's one of the great study guides I give students is to say, hey, here's all, here's all the terms that you'll need to know for a midterm or a final, and I posted them on the wiki. You go fill and make your own study guide. And as the instructor, I get to see who's participating and who's not participating. And then we tie in other products like Zoom. If I want to have a, a meeting with the class uh, off hours, or they want to meet with me. I can set up a Zoom meeting that the whole class can see and know, hey, we're going to have office hours today from 5 to 6. We're going to be on Zoom. They click a link, download Zoom, starts it up on the machine. And if you don't know about the magic of Zoom in the open source world, they actually have a Linux client that works awesome. That is simply awesome. Okay? Not like, you know, if you've ever had to go to WebEx and start up their Web1 and go, oh, it doesn't work in Linux. The other way to do that, of course, is, um, I'm not sure I have a document. Oh, look, I do. Is Zoom free or? or no, 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 Zoom is, Zoom would like your money, trust me. 
And the great thing, again, is with modern browsers, I can now just drag and drop my stuff right in there. Some other things to mention about Moodle is we actually use Moodle and we authenticate against our Active Directory to do that. And the reason why we do that is because, yeah, you know, hey, who doesn't want single sign-on? But we can actually build groups in Active Directory that correspond to our classes. So when a student logs in, it checks AD to say what groups are they part of, and actually hammers them into those classes, which is pretty awesome stuff. That requires a bit of Python and, um, and cussing on the back end, but, um, but swearing is part of any good programmer's uh, life. Um, but it, other than that, you know, then we've got a pretty robust thing. So the moment they log in, they're there. Sir? Uh, two things. One, I see student email. Yep. Is that being managed by another app? And two, oh, yeah. is email the primary means of messaging between people? You can. The, the great thing about um, up here is you can also send messages with inside Moodle as well. So if I've bombed something out to my students in terms of an announcement or something like that, this is, they'll get an alert right away as soon as they log into Moodle. Plus, whatever I send through an announcement forum, actually I can say, no, also convert that into an email. And as the instructor, and as a student too, it gives you 30 minutes to actually pull that back. So if you said something really stupid, <laughs> you know, you have your own little bit of 30 minutes grace that you can actually go, whoa, sorry everybody. Um, what else are we going to talk about? I can't show you grades. I wish I could because the grade book is really, really quite awesome. There's, um, you know, in terms of a faculty member, if they want to pull down their own, uh, their own backups, they can pull down their own backups. They can actually include the user information in there. They can an anonymize the user information if they want to. It does things like blind marking. So I've got, I've got uh, class material and I want to blind mark it so I don't know who the student is. Because we're not biased as professors other than the times that we're biased as professors. Um, and it allows us to get, get rid of that. Too. Do I think that, uh, plagiarizing check, is that you're using a service that you're running against? Yep. But there's a, couple, there's a couple of open source ones that go and just check uh, open source databases. The one that we use, turn it in, is about, it's about four grand a year. So it's not, that's not a lot of money, to be honest. And, and you said you could check uh, work that's turned in for one class against another class. It'll check it across the entire institution. Okay. Um, I've, the reason I'm kind of wondering about this is because I've had, where I've written papers for engineering societies and mm -hmm. all that, the, the plagiarism alerts pop up because what we're going through is I'm, I'm citing in the references in the back, I have eight references that kind of are the same here as they over here. Of course, references are in the exact same format. Yeah, exactly. You know, so. and, but turn it in is smart, smart enough to actually go, hey, he's put that in quotes or he's indented that and cited or it's, it. Or it's a reference. And so. it ignores it. Okay. Yeah, those kind of things. IEEE's tools does this as far as Yeah, it is as far as, yeah, which is strange for engineers. Right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> the other great thing is that if you wanted to run a pay site for Moodle, Moodle has tie-ins to PayPal. Moodle has tie-ins to, I think, there's now a Square tie-in as well. So if you wanted to actually charge for content, let's say I want to run my own Moodle server, I could let people create their own accounts, and I could actually start charging for course material that you provide. I mean, it's kind of that soup to nuts thing. It started out with this Australian university student who said our learning management systems suck because they were dealing with WebCT. If you, and if you had to deal with that, you know what I'm talking about. And slowly but surely, Moodle 1.0 emerged out of that. And here we are today. So I know I whizzed through that, but really, who wants to talk about Moodle for an hour? You know, nobody wants to talk about Moodle for an hour. Well, is there anything I can ask for y'all? Yes, sir. Moodle on the cell phone. Moodle on the cell phone. There's an app in the App Store that you can simply just point it at Moodle and it works. It's getting better. That's the best thing I can say about it. <laughs> and accessibility. 
Can you address that? I know it's, it's, I, I get the impression you're Canadian because you keep mentioning Canada. Yeah. And, and I don't know if the accessibility between the United States and Canada is at parity yeah. or there's a difference. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And it's got a, a ton of accessibility okay. settings that, that, that we do and don't use, okay. to be honest with you. So it, it's the nice part about it is that, you know, for example, we picked a theme that the screen readers would pick up. So that kind of stuff is there. Um, past that, I don't know if I've ever been asked any more on around the accessibility. And before I forget, too, it's also international. So if you want to simultaneously offer this interface in Spanish or in French, it will actually do that on the fly per student if you want. You know, it won't convert. Obviously, it won't convert it whatever the professor types in. But the interface will then change at least around. Sir. So if somebody didn't, let's say somebody didn't want to do their own server and they just wanted to use some hosting company, like... There's tons of them. What, yeah, I know. But so then you go in and you just click the Moodle button and it sets up the Moodle database. And what's your, you know, about the advantages and drawbacks of doing your own server versus just simply having somebody else's server? Um, like I said, Moodle doesn't cost me a lot of time and effort to maintain. Most of the questions I answer about Moodle are how to configure the gradebook, because it, that yeah. takes a little bit of taming of the, of the beast, right? But to be honest with you, I touch Moodle about three times a year. Like seriously go in and touch something where something isn't working right, and usually it's because I broke something because I installed it. An update. Really, for, for the hosting service, and, and that kind of needs to come down to is do you need to be operating 724 around the world? Or if you're in a smaller campus, smaller, smaller stuff, maybe that's sufficient. So, how you scale out, how big a load you have yeah. to be. Because I, I can see things where I've done where just three buildings, you've, the network cable probably runs between those buildings. So, you put it on one, if the network goes down to the outside world, you don't really care. I see. So, kind of comes down to if you're spread out across, with your school across, a lot of stuff, and you're using outside networks, you know, that might be a problem. In the province I'm in, there's a couple companies that offer middle hosting. No, sorry, there's one company that offers middle hosting to the institutions in Alberta. About half the institutions signed on, the other half run their own. So, for example, the U of A, which is our biggest institution in Alberta, probably about 30 to 40,000 students. They also cited that to a hosting provider. It's fine. Um, University of Lethbridge, which would be around maybe 10,000, decided, no, nah, forget, we're going to run our own. So they run their own. Cool. Anything else? You want, want to talk about counter? No, just so. <laughs> so uh, what are your thoughts? Have you run courses online versus like in person? Does Moodle adapt for your need in that kind of scenario? I think, I think that's what we liked about it so much, just because we could plug anything into it. Like that's where Zoom kind of got its start. Mm -hmm. So about five percent of our catalog right now is, is just pure online. Okay. So um, in defense, you'll you'll hear professors start to talk about either synchronous or asynchronous kind of yeah. stuff. And um, we do a lot with 50-somethings going back for education because we offer master's level programming. And that's all asynchronous stuff. Yeah. It, because it fits their work schedule. And I get that. Um, which, which Moodle is absolutely awesome at. Undergrads absolutely hate a lot of our online programming. Have you tied into why or what they're because they want to be in front of somebody. Yeah. They're looking for the experience. Okay. Yeah. The 50-something says, I want a degree. They have the experience of being in front of somebody. Yeah, I got to get, get out of here, right? You know, I got to go make some money. Um, <clears throat> but that being said, what they do appreciate, at least our undergrads appreciate it, is the interactivity. What our undergrads wish that we would do is actually record every single lecture and post it to Moodle. What our faculty are afraid of is that we'll post every lecture to Moodle and then the undergrads won't come to class. But we found that in classes that we do post that, the lectures to Moodle, they still come anyway. <laughs> sure, they watch YouTube videos in the back, but that's fine. <laughs> Whatever. No. But they, they at least come. They at least come. And, and we've got, sorry, 
And we've got some faculty members that really do something that I find interesting with Moodle is that they will record their lecture before class and use the class time as discussion time about the lecture. Yeah. And they use Moodle for that, which I think is an awesome way to do that. Make that, make that class time more, hey, what do you think? Is it, what, what I try to do as an instructor when I teach is I care about what they think about what they're learning. Because they have to go operationalize it. I can say, here's a whole bunch of terms. You know, you know, boringly, in my class, we talk about normalization of databases and things like that, right? <laughs> and I'm like, well, what does that mean to you? Why is that important? Why, you know, why is it important that, we, that we're moving to the cloud with all of our information systems? Why is that important? How does that matter to you? This? I want that data rather than having them listen to my thoughts. No, I was just going to say, I think it would be a fantastic reference as well from you know, my recollection of you know, being in school and stuff, you know, the professor's talking, you're madly scribbling down notes, but you're, you're always sort of lagging behind what they're saying, so to be able to go back and actually reference a, a talk or something would be... I come 40 years behind in some of those lectures. <laughs> <laughs> I just now understand. Yeah. And, and where this has is, is helped out the faculty members is that they don't have to reinvent the wheel every year because they carry their courses forward, update the content, off the, and they're off and running again. So. With your uh, growth in, in data size, like your data set size, like, do you see growing year to year? Do you see a drop? And I retain, because what I actually end up doing is, uh, we'll do, like for example, the winter term just finished uh, two weeks ago. So probably in a week, I will make the, the gold backup of that term, and I'll haul it off. And I make two, one with students and one without students in it, because invariably we have somebody complaining about the grades. Um, <clears throat> but at that point, I keep five years rolling. Yeah. That data, if I put it all together, to be honest with you, 20, 25 gigs. Yeah. Five years gig is small. You mean for the whole university? Yeah. For five three, for, data? for three, it's about 300, well, sorry, it's about 250 classes per term. Three terms, well, two and a half terms, because their spring terms are really small, for five years. But that's not only not with the course content. Then there's a lot of YouTube stuff. No, it would be link, link data. They're just links. Yeah, yeah. that's better than YouTube. Yeah. Not and I keep I keep the student data around for six months, and then we punt that out. So I keep just raw courses in that. Twenty twenty five gigs. It's nothing. And it's to the point that I just mount a share on our network and say, if you want a class from your old term, go find it. Yeah. Technical question. Uh, how well does uh, Moodle consume and spit out XML? I don't know if I've ever had to have it consume XML. <laughs> um, in terms of like code examples and stuff like that? You think? Well, I was thinking like cartridges or, or other or prepared data that's mm. being put through a, a DTD or some other scheme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a there's a, a few add-ins that I know that actually are, are throwing XML data at Moodle. Okay. So it must be consuming it quite nicely. Okay. For example, um, there's a lot of video hosting services that are throwing XML data back and forth so that right. they can show you a list of video. Because I saw the RSS going out, yeah. but I was wondering if it's coming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is, it is doing that kind of stuff okay. for it. Yeah. Great. But I've never had to play around with that much because, you know, fortunately, Again, lazy. So if it's prepackaged, so I'll be all there for you. <laughs> On the analytics side, um, you, you can spend, you can see who's participating, who's not. Um, how far does that go down? Like as far as you see when someone's like the video or stop the video? Yeah, let me uh, and um, I'll just swear you to secrecy. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think it's bad. We're not going to see. Well, sorry, we're not going to see any personal data here. But under where to go? So it actually has a, a live logging service that I can see what's going on. I can also jump in and um, then s start to narrow it down and say, hey, I want to just see this class, uh, whoever's in that class. I want to see just that activity. Mm -hmm. So um, like this never happens at other institutions or others. But in our institution, we have students say, hey, I Unfortunately, I couldn't turn that in on time because Moodle was down right then. And, uh, 
And I always come back to the fact that Mexico, go, well, that's funny, because the student was actually online then, and then they clicked on the assignment even, <laughs> and they just didn't bother to upload anything. <laughs> so we do those, you know, it drills down that nicely to it. Yeah. It tells you when, how long they were sitting on the site. It'll show it to you graphically. You can pull that up per user. Is the LRS built in with Moodle? Was that mm -hmm. happy? Didn't have to do anything. Okay. It was just there. Yeah, is your institution using Cricket now? No. Okay. No. no, actually I don't know any Canadians that are. Maybe there is. Really? Okay, but, that's, but that's no interesting anybody. to know. Yeah. Now the student email, is that linking back to a... That's our Office 365 application. Yeah, sorry, Microsoft just gives that away to education. We gratefully accept that. <laughs> <laughs> That's that SharePoint. SharePoint's for you. I was kind of wondering if you could try one of the, the Linux version scalers in those days. Yeah. No, literally, Microsoft called us one day and they said, we're going to give you licenses for your entire institution for the rest of your life. Great. Just, we'll take you up on that. It was really great to get out of business and buy a of fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I'm used to it. I think a lot of college students from north of the border, too. So, oh, yeah. have their advantage to have people. Yep. Familiar. Well, they give them free office too. Apparently, you know. now office online is for it, but you know, you know, they don't really care about us. Like so. Okay. Anything else, folks? Thanks for coming to talk. Come to a come to a talk on Moodle. Like I really thought they would just be <laughs> me and my friend. <laughs> supposed to be talk on noodles. Yeah. Oh, yeah, where's my lunch? I was talking to her and we go, I gotta put something on noodles? <laughs> 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 oh. Her middle school ran